Hi everyone, welcome to the CNCF End User Lounge, where we explore how the cloud native technologies are adopted by the end user organizations across different industries and sectors. The CNCF End User Community is formed of more than 160 vendor neutral companies that use open source software to deliver their product. I am Abubakar Siddiq Ango, I'm a CNCF ambassador, and today with me I have Dom Di Pascoli as a guest speaker. In these live streams, we bring end user members to showcase how the organization navigates the cloud native ecosystem to build and distribute their services and products. Join us every fourth Thursday at 9 a.m. PT. This is an official live stream of the CNCF and as such is subjected to uh, the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that will be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful to all of your fellow participants and presenters. If you have any questions for us, we'll be monitoring them in the chat throughout this stream. Make sure to ask your questions in the live stream chat. This week, we have Dom De Pascoli here with us to talk about how LinkedIn enabled the software engineering team at Penn State University to quickly troubleshoot performance issues when sending 68,000 COVID test invites to students, faculty, and staff member earlier this year. Before we dive into the questions, Dom De Pascoli, could you briefly introduce yourself and the organization you work for, please? Sure. So like you mentioned, I work for Penn State University. I'm the DevOps architect for the software engineering department within the university. So part of central IT. Yeah, awesome. So can you tell us more about the infrastructure set up at Penn State? Uh, how about if I just describe the one that I work with? Because it's okay, very sure. large. <laughs> <laughs> sure. sure. So we utilize Kubernetes on-prem on VMware and Kubernetes in AWS via EKS. And other than that, we're, you know, big Postgres, ActiveMQ, RDS from AWS, S3, SQS, all that kind of good stuff. Oh, awesome. So when did you start your, your cloud native journey and why? Um, it's a couple of years ago. Fewer, less than five, but I don't remember exactly when. And uh, cloud native journey, we we wanted to get into containerization, and and at the time, I'm not even sure we were thinking about Kubernetes yet, but we were getting close. The idea of breaking out our monolith into microservices is what we wanted to do. Um, eventually, we fell into Kubernetes, and this was early on Kubernetes when we didn't have a lot of great packages for deploying it, and. Uh, Kubernetes provided systems like EKS, AKS, GKE. They weren't available at the time. So it, we were we were young in the process when when it first came out. And uh, yeah, we we wanted to get there because of the we wanted to build that microservice architecture out. Oh, awesome. Now, can you explain more about some of the technologies and components that make your make up your stack? Sure. Uh, so like I mentioned, Kubernetes, uh, we Dockerize everything now. We're, I believe, 100%. Our apps are 100% containerized at this point. And I mentioned ActiveMQ and Postgres, but we also use a lot of the other native, like the, the tools that are kind of native to that Kubernetes landscape, which include Prometheus and Alert Manager and Cloud Auto Scaler for EKS or uh, it's not cloud outer scaler. Well, anyway, the auto scaler for EKS and other other like Kubernetes native things. Uh, I use Prometheus. Uh, I use operators for Jaeger. Okay. And I use operator for Elasticsearch and a whole bunch of good things there. Yeah, awesome. Now, did you get a chance to attend the KubeCon uh, event? We had like two earlier this year, the U uh, US and uh, Europe version, which ones were you able to attend in person or virtual? So technically I attended the Service Mesh Con Europe in the spring because I presented uh, this this topic here or this COVID topic there. Okay. But I, I didn't actually attend synchronously any of these, uh, okay. these cons. I ended up uh, just, 
I cherry pick videos after they get posted on YouTube. And I usually focus on security related things like um, the best practices of not just Arbok, but pod security. So security oh. contacts and getting into admission controllers with um, OPA and Gatekeeper, things like that are currently my interest. The other big interest that I'll focus on in videos for that is uh, CVE scanning of live pods, or at least the pod definitions. So you could get a good idea, especially when it relates to things like log4j, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a very uh, popular discussion now. Almost everyone is uh, is busy trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all we've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, going back to your work during uh, at Penn State during COVID, when COVID hit in 2020, your team uh, was asked to figure out how you you bring back students and staff safely. How did cloud native technologies help you to achieve that? Well. Nicely, like, luckily enough, we had uh, all the infrastructure uh, as code in place to to ter using Terraform. We ter you know Terraform this entire environment uh, utilizing EKS uh, to build that platform uh, within a matter of hours or days. So like we had Kubernetes and everything we needed up and running with no time at all. And because we have that cloud native platform that kubernetes platform and everything that goes around with it we were able to deploy apps very quickly i mean the only thing that held us up were changing requirements from the health staff at the yeah. university as we decided what you know what needed to be done to be able to test and schedule students and faculty and staff yeah awesome it, it's awesome to be able to achieve that and in your recent savage mesh con uh, talk you said LinkerD played a spe special role in that household. Uh, well, we wrap, we chose LinkerD a little while ago and it's just our default now. There's, there are only exceptions to using LinkerD. Otherwise it's, it's there. And uh, so we, when we built this new COVID environment, one of the first things that gets installed is LinkerD. So automatically all the new apps we're getting uh, you know, automatic retries, uh, MTLS, all that kind of good stuff. But uh, observability uh, was probably the big win. And uh, we could talk about that some more too. Yeah, awesome. So, and I guess you've already spoken about why you chose LinkedIn. What, are, what other options did you consider while you were exploring LinkedIn? Uh, originally, we were on Istio. And this, I can't remember how many years ago, two or three, three or four years ago. And uh, my team went to KubeCon in the fall, I forget what year it was, and they got to see the presentation by William uh, from Buoyant and they fell in love with the idea that it was everything you needed out of a service mesh without the complexity. And uh, that, that meant, <laughs> it meant a lot to us. <laughs> so then when we came back, when they came back, we, uh, I think, so that was the fall, like that January, we started ripping out SEO and replacing it with Linkerd, and we've been happy with it since. Yeah, and recently Linkerd uh, graduated. How has that changed anything for you? Uh, it helps sell its importance to, you know, the bureaucrats of a university. So let them know that this is not just an open source project that we're pulling in like a library. This is an, like a big deal to many, many organizations. So yeah. it was like a feather in a cap for them, but it was important for us, them being, you know, Linkerd, but it was important for us too as users. Mm, okay. So is there any other CNCF projects that you explored and what was your experience with them? Oh, uh, sure. We, you know, like I mentioned, we use a lot of the, uh, we use Prometheus and Alert Manager, and uh, we're starting to look at CubeMQ. I think that's possibly part of the CNCF landscape. Okay. But the way we the way we pick tools and projects is we go to the landscape first to decide is there a project or product out there that solves our problem before we go either building it or just scouring the uh, internet for something to help us out. So we start with the CNCF landscape every time. Okay, so um, 
I can imagine the internal usage growth uh, that using some of these technologies bring comes with some challenges. How did you handle cluster growth and adoption of these technologies? Internal usage. Um, I'm trying to think of how to uh, tell a story around that. I don't think I have a good answer now to think about it. <laughs> but cluster growth and adoption of these top, like the, the challenges is training of staff okay. it's when it's internal. So like we bring in new products, even if it's Prometheus and it's kind of already, I don't want to say it's built into Kubernetes, but it's, it's there. Like everybody yeah. knows it's going to be there. Like having folks know that they can get metrics about their deployments and things like that. It's a, it's a learning curve. It's yeah. just yet another tool, tool to learn when they were used to coming from uh, older systems or, uh, or maybe, no metrics available at all with some of the yeah. other systems, right? So it's really staff training with all the new tools and adoption of like, as, as our team picks new projects or tools, we have to make sure the entire staff is on board so they know how to use them too. Yeah, awesome. Now, do you rely on multi-tenant cluster deployment to manage, to distribute your workloads? What challenges does that bring for if you do? Well, if we're, are we, when we say multi-tenant, do we mean multiple customers in the same cluster type of thing? Yeah. All right. So we are currently alone in our clusters. Okay. And we split our clusters up by whether it's production or not production. Oh, okay. And then we might have some namespace splits yeah. after that based off of project or whatever. But um, in the future, we are going to a multi-tenant um, deployment and we are going to be worried about things like sharing resources yeah. and uh, network policies and RBOC security, all this kind of good stuff to, you know, share the resources as well as we can and also keep each, you know, projects secure from each other. Yeah. Even though that sounds mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how do you manage, uh, cluster automation then when it comes to things like upgrades, fashioning, testing, rollout of new features and so on. Yeah. So everything in EKS is done with Terraform. So that's the quick answer for that. You know, even our, uh, the control plane version upgrades, I could just Terraform the change there and wait yeah. another 45 minutes, whatever it is for the upgrade. And it's all versioned and taken care of there. Um, as far as testing that changes, like I mentioned, we have a non-production cluster that gets all the changes first. On-prem, we use Cube Spray currently to manage um, cluster upgrades. So that's that's more human involvement there, other than just a Terraform apply and kick your feet up. But you know, eventually, we'd like to do more EKS and less uh, Cube Spray. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's the gist. And it's the same cluster setup on prem where there's non prod and prod. Okay. Now, where is Penn State at today and what's next in terms of cloud native technologies? So, as I mentioned, uh, we're, we have a big presence on prem on top of VMware for our clusters. And our plan for 2022 is to migrate to a EKS for all of our Kubernetes clusters. Okay. At least we haven't found a situation where we have to stay on prem yet. There's always that possibility, but we haven't found it. So more managed services, still Kubernetes, and we're bringing more, more groups within the university on board. Okay. Uh, for example, right now, the libraries, the university libraries is using Kubernetes. So we're going to try to work with them to come up with a common platform that we all share. Oh. Awesome. You mentioned about uh, uh, training uh, developers as one of the main challenge uh, that you encountered. Can you tell us more what role uh, developer experience has played in the evolution of your clusters? I think in the evolution of the cluster is it you begin to realize when you make things so complicated that people can't get their job done that maybe things are too locked down or too stiff to use. And what we did to begin with, like we really trained, we, we tried to train everybody to use Kube Control for 
all their work. So if they want to see the status of their pods, want to see their logs, we expected them to do everything via, you know, command line. Yeah. And as we matured, like we put metric, we created a lot of Grafana dashboards so you could see the status of your deployments that way. Uh, we, we shared Splunk searches so you can just use Splunk for your logs searches there. Um, I think as far as the evolution of the clusters, we, I think we learned that a lot of people are still dependent, not dependent, mm -hmm. prefer not to use the command line for everything. Yeah. Uh, I've been using Linux for dozens of years now, so I, I want to use nothing but the command line. And mm -hmm. I just got to remember that when we design the interaction with Kubernetes clusters, it's not always going to be that way for everybody. Yeah, that's good. And uh, like you mentioned, you've been creating instrumentation around to make it easier for uh, your team to interact with the clusters. Like, how do they currently? Okay, you've already said you don't use the CLI because a lot of them shy away with it. What What other ways have you provisioned to enable them easily interact with the clusters? And what's like the typical life cycle of application deployment, maintenance, and troubleshooting for your team? All right, so the way that our folks interact, like to actually make change to the cluster, uh, we follow strict GitOps methodologies in our department and um, we use Flux for that. So we'll have our, I'll just tell the story of how you get an application out to production. I think that'd be easier. So yeah. I make changes to a program on my laptop and it's it's good to go. And I've tested it in Minikube because we wrote a, a tool to, that will automatically uh, compile, dockerize, and deploy into Minikube so you could test it locally. Yeah. Uh, from there, the Git push into the our, our GitLab repositories will trigger pipelines to do that same work again. And it also does a bunch of you know CVE scans of the uh, the Docker container, runs yeah. Sonar Cube against the code, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. Eventually, it creates a Docker image in a uh, Docker registry. Yeah. From there, we have uh, Flux watching those registries for updates. So we do automatic deployments of non-production yeah. uh, services. So hopefully, at that point, with everything being good, the you know non-production deployments are automatically updated and running, and uh, either developer or an external user can start testing that within a reasonable amount of minutes. Um, for production, we do merge request only changes. So if somebody wants to release, you know, version 1.1.2 of a service, uh, they would go in and update that YAML, create a merge request for a team lead or a manager to approve, and that would get it out to production. Hmm. And we do that all day long. Uh, yeah. You mentioned about uh, checking uh, the YAML files for CVs and other things. What tools do you use? You use something like Kix or which other tool? We're currently using uh, uh, Trivi to scan our Docker containers. Okay. So we use use it both for library scanning and OS scanning. I okay. believe we use it for a little little bit of file system scanning um, when we don't dock. So some of our libraries don't get dockerized. So it's getting uh -huh. used there as well. OK, awesome. And uh -huh. we just started using Starboard by okay. Aqua Security uh, this week. I bet you'll never guess why. Also, <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. so um, uh, what's your experience in others as an end user uh, in the CNCF community? You know, the, there are a lot of uh, vendors and other things out there, and sometimes it can be drowning to be an end user. What's your experience like? I think it's been uh, great, actually. And, and the time I was at the Seattle KubeCon, and I really enjoyed, really enjoyed my time there with meeting vendors, um, and and you know, having the opportunity to go to uh, maintainer sessions yeah. is always wonderful. And, and 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 of course, just going to regular sessions where you can learn about something new, like when our folks went to the Linkerd session and learned about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's all been very positive. I also really enjoy, it could be overwhelming, but the CNCF landscape map is super helpful. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's everybody's experience, but to have that one-stop shop about trying to find a 
a tool to help solve a problem, that that's really convenient. Yeah, yeah, it is. Now, um, in your organization, I think you've probably touched on this already, the future of cloud native uh, challenges at your organization. Are there any technologies or, or projects that you are interested in, in using in the future? Yeah, I, I think everybody's answer for that is different. Um, in my even within my department, right? Yeah. So this is this is my two cents. Um, it's it's again around security and and vulnerability scanning. So we're we're going to be looking more. Uh, I know like Gatekeeper is on our list of things to implement. Yeah. Um, like I said, I just started using Starboard this week from Aqua Security. Um, mm -hmm. I, I tend to keep going down those paths of, of security related tooling for cloud native. Yeah. Um, now I know there's also uh, parts of my team that are looking at uh, switching from ActiveMQ to more of a cloud native messaging platform as well. And I think I mentioned CubeM, CubeMQ, but yeah. you know, there are others out there as well. Yeah, awesome. And uh, with the way almost every part of the internet or the world now needs a patch or an update to fix some vulnerability, security becomes much, much more of a concern. Yeah, yeah. So and like in it, in our pipelines, we re rewrote our pipelines to make sure we're scanning specifically for these log4j vulnerabilities okay. and blocking the pipeline until it gets fixed. Oh, okay. You know, important things like that. And plus, the star starboard project really helped with the reporting of what pods are vulnerable currently. So, it was important to to approach it from both ends. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. To uh, we don't have any questions yet, viewers. If you have any questions, you can drop in the chat. Uh, before that, is there anything else that you probably want to dive more into or expand on that we've not covered yet? Um, no, I mean, uh, I could quickly touch on why Linkerd was so important for us in the COVID project and not just because of the free benefits that comes out of the box. Yeah, sure. Definitely. Uh, the short version of the story is we had a performance problem and we were trying to, we were trying to, you know, schedule 68,000 students to hurry up and get logged into the system and schedule their testing and we were doing it in batches, maybe a thousand per so many minutes or per hour or whatever. We needed to get it all done in one day, I think, was the, was the goal, though. And what was happening is every time we unloaded a, a new mass of notifications, students would log in and bring us down. Yeah. So long story short, we had an on-prem resource that was very much single threaded and couldn't keep up with the requests. But the way we found it was because of all the built-in dashboards that Linkerd provides. Okay. So we were able to go into the Grafana dashboards for Linkerd and find like, all right, well, service A depends on B, C, and D. And well, according to the dashboards, D is really slow, extremely yeah. late. So then we looked at service D and found out what it was calling. Well, yeah. that, that took us down to like, this was all on AWS. But all the services in AWS depended on our authorization and authentication systems on-prem. Okay. So then we jumped down to on-prem and realized, oh, look, and then we also have Linkerd down there. So we, and uh, we started digging into the same types of dashboards for the on-prem services and found out that this one in particular service was causing us lots of problems Yeah. Uh, to the point that everything was backing up everywhere. Uh, so what, you know, we had to make a code change to the on-prem service to, to remove that single threaded dependency and the floodgates opened at that point. But without that, you know, the ability to dig into the microservices and find out who's calling what and which of the downstream, or I guess it's upstream, which of the upstream calls is being slow, yeah. we would have lost. There's no way, like, I think we fixed it in a matter of an hour or, you know, I might be exaggerating, maybe it was a couple hours. Oh, okay. Uh, but without that, we would have been stuck big time. Awesome. It, uh, it's nice to share. I think most times a lot of uh, companies share success stories, and it's hard to hear some of the struggles and challenges that goes into 
uh, getting some of these things running. Thank you very much for mm -hmm. sharing that. Yeah, we still don't have any questions yet. If you are still on the chat, uh, you can ask any questions. Now, we have the CFP to KeepCon EU, which is probably is closing tomorrow, Friday. Are you looking towards maybe speaking at the next EU event or maybe next KubeCon any? Uh, I didn't have any plans to do so now, so I don't have any uh, papers, uh, any any uh, any submissions available. But I, I would be open to doing it again in the future if I could think of a topic. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. I think that brings us since we have no questions that brings us to the end of uh, this session thank you very much uh, everyone for joining the latest episode of uh, the cloud native end user lounge it was great to have them talking about uh, Penn State's usage of cloud native technologies we also really love uh, the wealth of experience he has also shared we bring to you the latest cloud native end user stories on the fourth Thursday of the month at 9 a.m. PT. Don't forget to join us for KubeCon, Cloud Native Con EU on May, from May 17th to 20th of uh, 2022 to hear the latest from the Cloud Native community. Also, if you would like to showcase your usage of Cloud Native tools as an end user, join the end user community with more details on cncf.io slash end user. Also remember the CFP for KubeCon EU is ending tomorrow. So get your talk submitted to be to be able to share your stories. Thank you very much. That, thank you very much for joining us today and see you next time. Thanks.